Well, now, I, you, oftentimes when we start together, I like to give you a funny story, something like that. Uh, I, I like to laugh at myself. I like to laugh, period. And so it's often not hard for me to come up with a funny story. But as I was thinking about today, no funny story to begin with came to mind. In fact, as I was thinking about uh, this particular text and just asking, well, God, what are you saying to me in my life through this text? Instead of going to some place that would be fun, I went to some place that was, in fact, the opposite of fun. As I was looking at this text, my mind went to 2020. Now, I want you to think for a moment about 2020. And I hope you all know and remember what happened in 2020. COVID hit the scene. Maybe you're trying to forget 2020. I certainly would love to forget 2020. But I would say of all the years of my life, uh, 2020 would make the list of three, one of the three worst years of my entire life. And it wasn't just because of COVID and all of that it represented. It's because of what was going on in the life of our family during that time, early on. In the spring during when COVID was first happening, the lockdowns were all first starting to get underway, my wife's mom, my mother-in-law, wound up going into hospice. So she very quickly developed a, a, a profound illness. We didn't see it coming. Everything was fine in the fall. And then suddenly by spring, we're in hospice. And so we're navigating hospice with her, and literally while we're in hospice, one day we walk into hospice, everything is normal. The next day we go to get into hospice, and they had the doors barred, and you had to get your temperature take it, taken and all this kind of stuff just to get into the building. And while we were there during that week, restrictions just kept tightening down, 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 down. Pam's mom passed away just a few weeks later, and it was, we were going to have her funeral, and no funeral home would let you have a funeral indoors. So here we are in Dayton, Ohio, in the spring. The weather is dicey at that time of year in that part of the country. And our only option was to have the funeral outside. And so that's what we did, and, and by God's grace, it all worked out. But you all, I've just got to tell you, it was not an easy season. And then right on the heels of burying... Pam's mom, Pam's sister got profoundly ill, life-threatening, and all of her treatment options were being influenced by COVID. And so because of some of the restrictions placed in COVID, she wasn't able to get a surgery that she needed. She had to go for another form of treatment first, experience and endure all of that treatment, and then after some of the COVID restrictions were lifted, then face the surgery and all that that recovery entailed as well. It took a serious illness that would have been a couple of months of really hard navigating and turned it into a serious illness that took the better part of a year to navigate. Her level of suffering skyrocketed. And I would just say she handled it so, so incredibly beautifully. But during all that time, 2020 for us as a family turned into one of those years where we looked at each other, Pam and I, and we said, you know what? <laughs> there is nothing left to do here but pray. <laughs> There's nothing left to do but pray. Let me ask you, have, have you ever been through a there's nothing left to do but pray season? I think many of us have. Maybe for you it's just been something quick. A few really bad days. You know, we've all had those times, though, that, that everything that you do it just seems to turn to dust. And it may be that you're in one of those seasons right now. I think back about just our neighbors just to our east. <laughs> and, you know, one day everything is fine. The next day, everything they own is blown all down the street. It happened just that fast. And for many, that's going to mean a season of hardship where it seems like, there's nothing to do but pray. Now, James chapter 5 talks to us about navigating those very kinds of seasons. Look at it in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? <laughs> he should pray. <laughs> Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. So here in James chapter 5, 13, James says, listen, sometimes you're going to go through a season in your life where the only right word to describe it is suffering. It could be any kind of suffering that you can think of. It could last for any duration of time, a year, a month, or just a week. But it seems like every time you turn around, there's just another hit coming. And James says, listen, when you're in one of those kinds of seasons where your life is best described by suffering, you need to be in prayer. 
in those seasons. But then in the same verse, did you notice, he flips it around and he goes the other direction there. Look at the second part of the verse there in 13. Um, Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. I just, I'm blown away by that contrast. James comes back and says, sometimes you're in a season of life where it's not suffering. Instead, everything about your life is up and to the right. I mean, it's just going incredibly well. And he says, what do you do in those moments? He says, don't take it for granted. Praise God for those days. And I would submit to you, here's the takeaway. In good times or in bad, when things are are going horribly and you are suffering, or when things are going unbelievably well and you are rejoicing, do not make the mistake of cutting God out of the equation. When things are good, be engaged with God. When things are bad, be engaged with God. Make sure that the foundation of your life, in good times or in bad times, is an intimate and tight relationship with God. But as James is thinking this through, it's clear that he's drawn to the first part of that verse. He's drawn to the idea of suffering because as we drill down through the next few verses, he begins to take on some of the specific things, the specific causes that we have in common in relationship to suffering. Look at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church. They are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, this passage has been misunderstood for a lot of years, okay? And I want to talk to you about what this passage does not mean and what it it does mean. Right off the bat, what does it not mean? This passage of Scripture does not mean that if you're sick, you shouldn't go to the doctor. It does not say that, okay? Okay. Let me just tell you, friend, if I am sick, I'm going to the doctor. If I'm sick, I want every tool of modern medicine brought to bear to help me get well. How many of y'all enjoy suffering physical pain? It's lousy, isn't it? Ever had one of those pains that wakes you up in the middle of the night, you can't sleep, you can't get comfortable? It's miserable. Why would you not want to take advantage of all that medicine has to offer to help you alleviate pain? The Bible affirms the use of medical treatments such as applying bandages, oil, wine, and salves to wounds. Luke, the author of the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke, was a doctor. Paul called him the beloved physician. To that I would say amen, okay? I've often looked at my own doctor and said, I love you, man. Bring it in, right? Because it's good to have somebody who's on your side who can help you navigate seasons of great pain. So bottom line is... If you're in pain, go to the doctor. Don't be that guy, okay? Don't be that girl, okay? That's a minimum. So here, when you look at this, James is not calling us to do less in order to get better. He's not calling us to skip the doctor. James is calling us to do more to get better. Think of it that way. Don't just stop at the doctor. Keep on going all the way from the doctor's office to your church. The picture that James gives here is of somebody who's kind of bedridden. They're ill, they're unable to go to church, and so they call the church and they say, please send the pastors, the deacons, and anybody else that you can find over here because I want good, godly people praying for me. Here at Celebration, we see this happening all the time. People will reach out to us and say, hey, so-and-so is sick, I'm sick, whatever the situation is, can one of the pastors come and pray with us? We've got a pastor here on our staff. You, many of you all know Doug Bedgood. If you know Doug, you know that Doug has a pastor's heart that simply will not quit. If you are sick, you want Doug Bedgood and his wife, Jana, standing beside you, praying with you. I just promise you that. We've got deacons in our church that do a fantastic job here. We are happy to respond to that and have people come and pray with you. Then James goes on a little bit further and he says, uh, those same church leaders can also anoint you with oil. Now that's just weird and curious, is it not? Why? What is going on here? Well, there's some different ideas about exactly what James meant when he said this. Some believe that the oil is sacramental, meaning that the anointing of oil imparts grace to the person being anointed. Now this is the Catholic view. And I would, I would disagree with this. I'm, I'm a Baptist, not a Catholic. I would disagree with this because I don't believe that God dispenses grace in response to our works. God expends grace to us or extends grace to us as a free gift. 
Other people look at this and they say, well, clearly the reference here is that uh, oil is medicinal. And that's certainly possible. In the ancient world, oil was used as a medicine. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Right? The, the, the man who was injured, his wounds were, were treated with oil by the Good Samaritan, right? So we know that oil was used in that way. But the challenge with that part is there's no reason to think that church leaders had mo better oil, right? Their oil would have been the same as someone else's oil. And there's no reason to believe that a church leader would have had uh, maybe medical training and how to treat wounds or, or whatever might, be, uh, might necessitate treatment with oil. So it's likely not just medicinal. Others believe that what you see here, the oil is symbolic. If you look at the Old Testament, you, you find that kings and prophets and priests were set apart by anointing. So anointing in this case uh, could uh, picture uh, everyone's dedication, their con- concentrated dedication to pray for this person. And I love that. And I would submit to you that that's what's on display here. The anointing is a physical way to demonstrate concern and a commitment to pray for the sick. If you, if you take that view, then when you come to verse 15, it makes a lot of sense. Look at chapter 5, verse 15, the first part of the verse. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. Okay, do you see the connection there with prayer? Now, again, we've got to ask a question. Does this mean that if you pray with enough faith, that somebody will be healed? Well, now, this just doesn't match up with our experience, does it? Uh, throughout the years, in fact, if you look back over at your lifetime, okay, odds are good that someone you know has been seriously and profoundly ill. And if that person is, is a, a Christ follower, someone who is a part of a church family, they've called for pastors and deacons and other church leaders to come, and those people have prayed earnestly with that person that they might get well. They've joined with the family. Everybody has come together. Everybody is praying with great passion that this person would be well. And yet, we all know that some of those family members went on to live and recover. Others didn't. Would we take from this that that if, if we prayed and someone didn't get well, then those people lacked faith? Would we say to that family, well, you, the problem is you lacked faith and, and that's why your loved one passed away? Well, that just doesn't seem reasonable at all. So if that's not what James means here, what does he mean? Well, if you look down to verse 17 and 18, James gives us an example of the kind of prayer that he has in mind. Look at it in verse 17. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Can we agree that is a response to prayer, my friend? Okay. Verse 18. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. So here James points back to a story from 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. And he tells us part of the story about a prophet named Elijah who confronts an evil king named Ahab. And he prays that it will not rain, and it doesn't rain, James says, for three and a half years. Now if you go back and you read the story there in 1 Kings, what stands out isn't Elijah's prayer life. What stands out is the activity of God. Because if you read the story carefully, you find that the, the word of the Lord came to Elijah telling him that it wouldn't rain. Then, then again in 1 Kings 18, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah and tells him that the rains will return. So what do we see happening here? We see Elijah in his prayer life agreeing with what God has already revealed to him. It wasn't Elijah's plan that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. It was God's plan that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. So what James is saying here is, listen, a person of faith understands the sovereignty of God, and they know enough to pray in faith that God's going to do the right thing. If God's going to heal, then God heal. You are more than able to do so. God is capable of doing whatever the right thing is to do. And so what a person of faith does is they seek to discern God's will, and they pray accordingly. A lot of years ago, I was fresh out of seminary, uh, much like Zach. We just got through uh, seeing uh, be licensed into ministry. Uh, I was fresh out of seminary, and I wound up pastoring this little country church. And you all, I didn't know anything about ministry. 
and I knew it, and my big fear was that the church would figure it out. I think they already knew it, okay? So we just kind of bumbled along in happy and blissful ignorance together while I served in this first ever little country church. While I was there, uh, there was a, a guy that was kind of the organizer or coordinator for Baptist churches in the area. He was called the director of missions. His name was Glenn. Glenn was a sweetheart. He was just one of the nicest people. And Glenn was probably in his, he was old. He was probably in his late 50s, something like that. You know, he was, he was ancient. He was ancient like that, right? And Glenn looked at me, sized me up, and thought, this kid doesn't know anything. And he just kind of really adopted me. And Glenn would drop by and encourage me, and he would answer phone calls for me and just kind of do all he had. He'd been in the ministry for probably 30 years, and, and so he was really there to help me. One night, we had kind of a, a, mission, a, a meeting of all the, the pastors in the association. And Glenn stood up to speak to this group of, I don't know, 20, 25 people. And after he told a few things, gave some announcements and updates about the association, and then he said, listen, I just want you all to know something about me. He said, I was at my doctor's office this week, and I got a potential diagnosis, a preliminary diagnosis. And I just want you all to know, it's bad. And the doctor's already told me to prepare for the worst. And he went on to explain to us a little bit about what was going on, and um, he said, I would just like it. If y'all would pray, he said, I go in just a couple of days, I go back to the hospital and they're going to do all these tests and all these scans to verify the diagnosis and then to begin to set a treatment plan. So we gathered up, we all kind of got together in a big circle and uh, we started to pray. And as we prayed, I, I don't know why, but I just got this overwhelming sense that the right thing to do would be to just say in my prayer, as I prayed aloud as a part of the group, God, I believe you're going to heal Glenn, and you're going to heal him completely. And you're going to do this for your glory. Now, as we stood there in that circle, you all, I got to admit, I'm kind of nervous because I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to throw that out there or not, you know. But you all, it was an overwhelming sense that that was the right thing to do. And it really began to feel to me that, that if I don't do this, I would be disobedient. So I just spoke up in that circle. And I prayed aloud, God, I believe you will heal Glenn uh, and that you're going to do this for your glory. And I'm just confident of that. Thank you, God, for doing what you're going to do. And I got to tell you, after that meeting was over, I got some real looks. <laughs> okay, People were like, hmm. Okay, there you go. All right, but I just, for me, not to have done that would have been wrong. A couple of days later, Glenn goes to the hospital in Nashville for all the scans that were needed to determine the severity of his illness. And then when reports came back, there was no evidence of cancer at all in his body. Okay? Now, I don't tell you that story because I want you to think David is a healer. Okay? <laughs> Oh, no, far from it, okay? Do I believe that I healed Glenn? No, I do not believe that I healed Glenn. I want to be abundantly clear there. Do I believe that in that moment, God in his providence revealed to me that he was going to heal Glenn? Yeah, I do. I believe that, that God invited me to pray in alignment with him about what his plan for Glenn's life was. And I would submit to you that that's exactly what we see going on here in James. He's not describing somebody who's uttering an incantation, right? And because they uttered the right words, God is compelled to heal whether he intended to or not. That's not at all what he's saying here. He's describing a person of great faith who, like Elijah, tunes their prayers to match what God is doing. So that's the first part of verse 15. Then you come to the second part of verse 15, and it's just as stunning as the first part. Look at the second part. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And so as you look at this part of the verse, you're going, wait a minute, is, is James saying that all or even most illnesses are a result of sin? Again, no. That's not what he's saying at all. Is he saying that some illnesses can be the result of sin? Yeah. 
That's exactly what he's saying. And even today, with with all the scientific capacities that we have, we know that what James is saying here is absolutely true. Right? Uh, Just uh, for example, we know there's a link between promiscuity and certain diseases, right? We know that that's the case. We all know that there are certain behaviors that we can engage in in life that are absolutely risky. If you engage in those behaviors, it might go very, very badly for you. The connection between sin and sickness can be obvious. But that's only one example of how our physical health can be impacted by sin. For example, it's well known that guilt, the kind of guilt that goes with unconfessed sin, can trigger problems like OCD, anxiety, and depression. And these ailments can trigger problems like sleep or digestive disorders. And the longer we wait to deal with the underlying cause, the problems just keep getting worse and worse and worse. So with all of this in mind, James says, hey, listen, you've got to do something about this. Look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. So James just challenges us here to to lean into our church family and to confess our sins one to another and to recognize that by dealing rightly with our sin, we find healing both spiritually and sometimes physically as well. Now, as I'm working on this, I'm thinking about confessing our sins one to another, going to the church and confessing. I thought, what would that look like? Then I thought, would it be a good idea for us on Sunday mornings to just have an open mic right here? And, you know, I would just say, hey, everybody, if you would like to confess your sins to the body, come on down, right? Can you imagine? Now, if I would hope that many of you all go, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. Uh-uh. That'll be a lonely mic, okay? That would just be kind of, of odd, would it not, Okay. And I don't believe that's what James is advocating for here at all. I think what James is saying is, listen, you need to lean into your church family. You need to develop within your church body the kind of deep relationships that open the door for there to be a safe and appropriate environment for you to be honest about the sin with which you struggle. Pull in close. Find some good people who will hold you accountable, who will engage you, And get those people together and confess your sin. Because we find grace in that. We find healing in that. We find relief in that. And this is just intensely practical stuff from James. Because most of us deal with the reality of suffering or sickness or setbacks from sin in real time in our life, don't we? This is just a part of where we live. So let's put all of this together and... Just learn what is it exactly that James is telling us to do in order to find relief from suffering or from sickness or from sin. As I I read this, one of the things that came to my mind was, David, you need to take care of yourself, of your body. You just can't take your physical health for granted. I don't know about you all, but I don't want to, to suffer and be sick. What about you? I'm sick very, very rarely. I got a summer cold this summer. I coughed for two months. I'm like, what are we doing? Okay? This is not me. Okay? That's just not how I... And I, Pam will tell you, I whined like a baby for two months. Okay? I was not stoic in a man. I was like, I'm still coughing. I mean, it was ugly. Okay? It was ugly. All right? I don't want to be that way. I don't enjoy suffering at all. So there are some things that I can control, some things that I can't control about my welfare, right? I can't control everything about my environment. I can't control my genetics. They are where they are. I'm not getting any taller. I've waited for a lot of years for that to occur. Here I am, okay? There are a lot of things about my physicality that I cannot control, but I do need to take care of myself. I need to do my best to eat well, to get exercise, get plenty of rest, go to the doctor. (laughs) I just can't take my health for granted. And you might be thinking as you look at this text, you might be thinking, David, how did you get here? Because how does your physical health, what does that have to do with your relationship with God? Isn't my relationship with God really kind of a a spiritual thing, not a physical thing? 
Well, Jesus was asked, you might remember, which commandment is the most important of all? And look at his response. Here it is in Mark 12, verse 30. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all your what? Strength. Okay? Now, we resonate. We are drawn to loving the Lord with all of your heart and soul. Right? We, we kind of connect with that. We want to be about that. That's really good. Loving God with your mind, that sounds like work. That's starting to sound like school, right? But at the same time, we recognize that there is enormous value, enormous value in learning more about God, learning more about his word. So we, we can buy into that. But when it comes to loving God with all of our strength, with, with our physicality, with our bodies, we tend to want to look at that as an afterthought. And here Jesus is saying, don't do that. Do your best to be able to love God with all the physical capacity he has given you. So James picks this idea up and he reminds us not to overlook the reality that our spiritual welfare, welfare has a tremendous amount of influence over our physical welfare. Think for just a moment about your physical health. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. How are you doing? How are you doing? Just rate yourself right now. Good, average, bad. How are you doing? Now, as you think about your physical health, let me ask you, How's your spiritual health? Are you protecting yourself from those spiritual liabilities that can have a real-time impact on your physical health? Okay? Think about it. Let me ask you, how's your purity? Okay? How good a job are you doing at just guarding your heart? How good a job are you doing at managing intimacy in a way that's God-honoring? What about holding on to bitterness and anger? How are you doing there? What about stress at work? Are you making time for rest, for prayer, for worship? See, all of these are biblical mandates, and all of them have a profound impact on our spiritual welfare, to be sure, but they also have a huge impact on our physical welfare as well. So take care of your body, and remember that your relationship with God can have a direct impact on you physically, okay? That was one thing that I just learned from this. Second thing uh, that I learned from this was simply this. When you're suffering, lean into your church. Lean into your church. When you're sick, lean into your church. When you're in sin, lean into your church. James says if you're sick, go to the elders. Lean into your church. If you're dealing with consequence of a sin, then lean into your church. Confess your sin one to another. Yeah, I think that one of the most important things that you can do as a part of your journey in church is to be involved in a good small group. We've got so many options here. You know, all kinds, all different ages, all different types. Some meet on Sundays, others meet other days of the week. Then we've got a, a type of group here called a tea group, which is really small. It's only three or four people. I just started a brand new tea group this week. I'm excited about it. For the next 30 weeks, I get to hang out with this group, me and three other guys I'm really looking forward to it. I've led a lot of tea groups over the years. I love them. One of the things that I really like about tea groups is how intimate they become. I told my guys today, I said, or this week rather, I said, listen, uh, trust me, the tea group's going to be a little weird for the first five weeks, but then on week six, things begin to change. That's just been my observation. I've done, I don't know, 15 or so tea groups. Somewhere around week six, all the walls just come down. And I've been in those tea groups where we've, where we've borne one another's burdens, for real. We've talked about what's going on. I mean, really going on. We've talked about sin. We've talked about shortcomings. We've talked about all those things. Let me just tell you, that is so, so important. Get involved into a great group of people that you can really, really confide in. One more that kind of came to mind, and this one's really important to this text, and that is prayer. Really lean into prayer. The word pray is mentioned seven times in these five verses. You think prayer is important to, the, to, to James? Really matters a lot. It may be that right now there are some real barriers for you in praying, and, and you're dealing with those. For example, one barrier to prayer is that you just simply don't make time to do it. You're just so busy you got so many things happening. And you might even be telling yourself, you know, God knows exactly what I need. 
He's ahead of me. He doesn't need me coming to him, bothering him. I know I don't need people coming and bothering me. So I'm just not going to pray, and I'm just going to trust that God's going to figure it all out. And it is true that God knows what we need, and he gives us so many good things without our even asking. Isn't that true? But it's also true that God has invited us to pray because there are times in our lives when we need to see the connection between his activity and our ask. We need to see the connection between his activity and our relationship with him. And that's really the key because when we don't make time to pray, we're effectively saying that our relationship with God does not matter because prayer is so central to our relationship with him. And so if the whole idea of uh, or your relationship with God is kind of eluding you, spend more time in prayer. Let me just give you a simple challenge. For the next 30 days, make a commitment, do it today, make a commitment that for the next 30 days, you'll spend at least 15 minutes a day in prayer. 15 minutes. It's not much time, okay? FSU scored 30 points in like 15 minutes last night, okay? <laughs> Didn't take long, okay? 15 minutes. 15 minutes a day in prayer. Make that commitment for 30 days. Give your time, self-time to develop a legitimate, happen, a legitimate opportunity to make it happen and see what happens in your relationship with God if you create that habit. What if one of your barriers for prayer is that you don't know what to pray for? Well, how about asking God, okay? This ties right back into what we just saw in James, right? Okay, aligning our prayer with what God's will already is. James talks about this in James chapter 1, verse uh, 5. He says, Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives it all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Let me just tell you, God wants you to have the wisdom necessary to ask for the right things when you pray. So let's say that somebody that you love is ill and you want to know how to pray. And say, God, this person, this friend of mine, this, this family member of mine is ill, and I don't know what to ask for. And, and so just show me, Lord, what your will for this person's life is. And as you pray that, you just kind of, you don't really get any real clarity. What do you do then? Well, you can always just start asking for the things that you know God wants to do. God, I know you want best for this family. God, I know you want this family to come to know Jesus Christ. God, I know you want a kingdom impact on all the friends and so forth, the people who are connected to this person, everyone who is watching is a part of this process. You love every single one of them. God, I want you to declare your glory to every single one of them. You can always pray right there. He said, yeah, but David, I just want to pray that my friend gets well. Well, then pray. God, I want my friend to get well. Let me just, Lord, let me just tell you the desire of my heart. I want my friend to be well. But as you pray that and as you begin to see what God is doing, then you can tune your prayer. It may be that as you pray, God, I want this person to get well. But as you continue to walk with them, you begin to realize God has other plans. Have you ever been with someone who is near the end of their life and, and you go in with them and you're very saddened by what's going on and as you speak to them and you're like, man, we're praying that you get well and they look at me and they say, I'm praying that I get out of here. I'm praying that I wake up in heaven. I'm praying that I get to go home and be with the Lord. I'm excited for what comes next. Have you ever been with somebody like that? So do you see what I'm saying here? It's okay to tune your prayer and say, Lord, I see what you're doing. You're about to take this person that I love home. So God, my prayer is, is that's exactly what happens. My prayer is that you give them a taste of your glory and you do it soon. And God, thank you. Thank you that this is not the end. Thank you that suffering is not the end. Thank you there is an eternity to look forward to for those who are in Jesus Christ. And you just align that, right? And you realize, you know, sometimes I, when I pray for what I want, God, his answer is no. <laughs> and when I hear God say no, then I have to have the wisdom to say, God, I'm going to change here. I'm going to tune what I'm praying so that it aligns with your will because I want your will to be done, not my will to be done. And when we do that, what are we declaring? We're saying, God, we recognize that you are good. And God, we recognize that you are wise. And we trust you to do the best thing possible right here, right now. Hey, let me just ask you, are you going through a season of suffering right now? 
Is that where you're at? One of those seasons where it seems like, man, there's nothing left to do but pray. I mean, to say, man, if you're in that season, you want to be able to stand firmly on your relationship with God. That's your foundation. That's what you got. Okay? God has provided us with these resources, the church and prayer and so, but it all flows from a relationship with God. And if you're here today and you do not have a relationship with God, why would you leave here today facing the crises of this life alone? Why? Why not just say today is the day? Let's pray together right now. Father, we love you. We're so grateful that you hear our prayer. We're so grateful that you invite us to pray. And Lord, we're so grateful that when we are going through the most difficult seasons of our life, seasons of real suffering, we're so grateful that you hear our prayers and that we can count on you. There are people, Lord, in this room right now who are going through a season of suffering. I pray, Lord, that you just today speak to them, comfort them, and invite them to lean in. Lean into you. Lean into your church. To surround themselves, not just be alone all the time, but to surround themselves with people who love you. People who are going to pray. People who are going to care. People who are going to serve. People who are going to minister. Even people who will hear the confessions of our own sinfulness and still love us anyway. So, Father, I just pray that for everyone here in this room today, we leave here with confidence that we have access to those resources that you have for us when we're suffering. We have access to a loving Father who hears our prayer. We have access to the people of God who will pull us in close. And for anyone, Lord, who's here today and they don't have that, I pray that they leave here today saying, God, I need you to be my Father. I need to know that you hear me. So make me your child. Adopt me into your family this day. We love you, Father. We pray this in the great name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, Amen.